So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Frank Aparbier. Um, he's going to be talking about last role in uh, the GO satellite program and the upcoming launch of the next GO satellite on March 1st. Frank, I'm going to ask you to turn your screen on. There we go. All right, so Dr. Parvier is a senior research scientist and an assistant science director at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, LASP, in Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Parvier grew up in Nina, Wisconsin. He's always been interested in space and he appropriately graduated from the Neil Armstrong High School. He received his PhD from CU Boulder's Astrophysical Planetary and Atmospheric Sciences Department in 1991 under LAST's former director, Dr. Charles Barth. His research interests include solar variability and the impacts on the atmospheres of Earth and other planets. He has been involved in the development of several spaceflight solar instruments throughout his career, including instruments on NASA's timed mission, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, or SDO mission, and NASA's MAVEN Mission to Mars mission. He's been instrumental in ensuring last involvement in the NOAA GOES program since 2006 and is the lead of the EXIS instrument, which we're going to hear about tonight on the GOES R plus satellites. Thank you, Dr. Parvier, for joining us this evening. I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Amy. Um, start my share. How's that look? Looks good. All right. So as Amy said, um, I'll be talking about GOES. And most of the time when you hear about GOES, you think about weather. Um, all of the weather satellite imagery you see on the evening news and online tends to come from the GOES satellites. And even if you go to the uh, GOES T launch um, website, you'll see this tagline, Earth in high definition. But if I were in charge, I would call it sun in high definition because GOES doesn't only look at the Earth, it also looks at the sun. And in fact, the title of my talk is looking at the sun to protect us on Earth and how the GOES satellite program does that. This is a XKCD um, cartoon from a few years ago that I thought was very appropriate for this. It is a scale of how worried you should be if you hear reporters interviewing scientists. And on the left side, you see the types of scientists you shouldn't be too worried about hearing on the news. And on the right side, you see the ones you should be really worried about. And at the top of that scale is an astronomer who talks about the sun. So GOES is a weather satellite, but there's another kind of weather. The sun and the earth are a complex and connected system with the sun giving off all these light and charged particles and magnetic fields. And those are all going out into the solar system and interacting with the planets and in particular earth, since that's where we live. And we call that space weather. And this is a, uh, very simplified diagram of our understanding of the space weather system. And yes, this is very simplified, <laughs> believe it or not. And we're gonna talk all about all of it all night long. And by the end of this, you'll understand everything and there'll be a big quiz. I'm just kidding. This is just to um, demonstrate that uh, it is a very complex system and there are a lot of different things that need to be tracked to understand what's going on with space weather. Space weather itself starts with the sun. And the sun, as I said, is giving off light at all different wavelengths. And how much and at what wavelengths those, that light is coming out into the solar system depends on what's going on on the sun. And the sun is also giving off charged particles and magnetic fields in the form of the solar wind and coronal mass ejections, which are large blobs of charged particles and magnetic fields that rip away from the sun and go out into the solar system. 
one constant about the sun is that it's always changing. Um, and it changes significantly on all time scales from just a few seconds for things like solar flares to years and even centuries for solar cycles and long-term solar variability. And it also changes on all size scales. If you look at the sun in close, close detail, you'll see things changing constantly. But if you look at it as a whole, you'll also be seeing huge global changes going on on the sun. The changes on the sun go through activity cycles. Um, everybody's heard about the solar cycle and that's uh, roughly a 10 year, uh, 11 year, maybe sometimes 15 year cycle where the sun goes from being um, a very quiet, simple, magnetic field like the earth, kind of this dipole shape like with the North and South Pole and nice magnetic fields and very little activity. And it gets all wound up and gets, that magnetic field gets all knotted and very active and changing over this cycle. And during that time, we get more and more activity at the peaks of the solar cycle. And that activity is seen in brightness at certain wavelengths, particularly the short energetic wavelengths, ultraviolet and X-rays. You'll see more sunspots or active regions as they're called when we look at them in, in the ultraviolet. Um, you'll see more and bigger solar flares. You'll see more of these coronal mass ejections, these blobs of plasma shooting off from the sun out into the solar system. And there are solar cycles that have been very large and there are solar cycles like the recent ones, the last one and the one we're currently in that have been weaker. And the weaker cycles tend to have maybe as much activity, but it's much weaker activity and the flares are smaller and, and such. And we're currently in one of those. This diagram on the lower um, right shows an ultraviolet or soft X-ray image of the sun over a solar cycle. And you can see it's very calm and quiet at the beginning in 1996. And then by 2001 at the peak of, of this solar cycle, uh, two solar cycles ago, there's a huge amount of activity. You see lots of big knots of magnetic fields and bright plasma. And, uh, and then that, um, reverses and gets calmer and calmer until it's back to solar minimum again. We call it solar minimum when it's quiet and solar maximum when it's not. This is a movie from the SDO um, imager in the ultraviolet and it, it's spanning a few days, but um, you can see these active regions, which in the visible are dark, but in the ultraviolet are light and you see flares going off, and you see that the sun itself is, is changing constantly. Another way to look at the sun, this is uh, from superposing a, an image of the sun in the ultraviolet with a coronagraph. A coronagraph blocks out the bright disk of the sun and looks at the dim emissions or scattered light off of the particles coming off the sun. So what we're seeing in these streamers is the solar wind, and then these bursts coming off are what we call coronal mass ejections or CMEs, those blobs of plasma I talked about. And this also is, is a movie that's sped up and it's spanning uh, multiple days, even uh, probably a couple of weeks. So if we look at the output of the sun and how it varies, um, one of the ways that the sun transfers energy out into the solar system is through light or photons. And during the solar cycle and solar activities like flares and things like that, you get increased ultraviolet and increased X-rays. And light, since it's the fastest thing in the universe, gets to the earth before anything else. So light is what we look at to see what's going on on the sun only eight and a half minutes ago. That's how long it takes for the uh, 
light to get to Earth. And when the ultraviolet and X-rays from the sun get to the Earth, they're all absorbed in the upper atmosphere. The ex uh, extreme ultraviolet, the shorter wavelengths of ultraviolet, and the X-rays all um, go into the atmosphere and they heat it up. So to get more light from the sun at these wavelengths, the atmosphere itself heats up more. And you can see that at say 200 kilometers in altitude above the surface, the temperatures can range from about 500 Kelvin up to 1500 Kelvin, a factor of three bigger um, just from solar minimum to solar maximum. And when you heat up a gas like the atmosphere, it means the atmosphere expands and gets bigger. So at any given altitude, the atmosphere is expanded, but at that altitude, the density has gotten higher. And so at say 200 kilometers, you can have a density change by an order of magnitude, depending on the amount of solar activity. And what that can lead to is satellite drag. If you have satellites flying around in low earth orbit, we have satellites that are at say 400 kilometers, 450, that's where the space station is. They have to watch out for solar activity because they'll have increased drag and cause them to um, lower in altitude or not last as long in orbit. Uh, this is a plot showing uh, on the y-axis is latitude on Earth in the atmosphere. And you're looking at the level, the density at the level of, uh, I think about 500 kilometers. And time is on the x-axis. You can't really see it, but it's a few days. And a solar flare goes off and the density changes almost immediately at this altitude by a factor of two, just from a flare going off. What the UV and X-rays also do in the upper atmosphere is ionize it. It creates the ionosphere. And you get large day-night changes because at night there is no UV, so it's not as ionizing. Um, and in the day you get a lot of it, but also when you have solar activity, you'll get more um, ionization from these, these energetic photons. And that has big effects on uh, communications and GPS and you can, can get radio blackouts. And this is because um, radio waves are transmitted through the atmosphere and the atmosphere is like, think of it like glass and it can refract the signals. And the more ionization you have, the more they get refracted. And so GPS can see, works by looking along the line of sight to satellites and triangulating. But if the atmosphere is highly ionized, you think the satellite is in a different place because the signal has been refracted. And so you're mislocated. Uh, you can also get disruptions because of the ionization. You get reflections and absorption and scattering of your radio signals. And that, that can cause a lot of communication problems. Now the sun also gives off energetic particles. And sometimes when you have a solar flare, it, it's accompanied by a burst of really high energy particles that are coming at uh, relativistic speeds. And those are generally protons. And they get to the earth in minutes to hours. And that's really fast if you think about how far away the sun is. Um, that's if it takes eight and a half minutes for light to get here and it, say 30 minutes for these particles, then you know that these particles are really energetic. And those energetic particles can bathe our satellites and our astronauts with dangerous radiation that can harm the electronics and the hardware in the satellites and the people. We've seen satellite anomalies and failures attributed to uh, these energetic particle effects, um, things like surface charging and, and computer single event upsets, which basically are like brain farts in the uh, computers of our, our satellites. And you can get uh, this deep dielectric charging and get static discharges going on inside the satellite. You can also get um, very noisy uh, imagery. And if you have a satellite that's taking pictures, it can get uh, really fuzzy pictures. And this is an example here of uh, an imager that's looking down at the earth and an energetic particle comes and it just basically is 
snows out the image because all these charged particles are hitting the detector. Um, these energetic particles can also um, modify the ionosphere because they're so energetic, they just go right into the atmosphere and, and ionize just as much or more than the uh, EUV and X-rays do. And that can also disrupt radio communications and cause radio blackouts. And uh, the, uh, there's an example of a, a headline where a solar strong solar energy particle event disrupted the uh, communication satellites that NATO uses in Europe. Now the third kind of um, activity from the sun that has a space weather effect at earth is from what we call geomagnetic storms. A CME, a coronal mass ejection, is a blob of plasma, charged particles and magnetic fields that breaks off from the sun and travels out into the solar system. And it can take two to four days to get to the Earth. And it will impact the Earth's magnetosphere and rattle up our magnetosphere and interact with it. And it will produce enhanced aurora or northern and southern lights. We call that a, a geomagnetic storm. And it's dumping a whole lot of energy into the high latitudes around the poles. And that causes heating like the UV. Uh, but at the high latitudes, and that increases solar drag for polar orbiting satellites. Um, it also, because of all that radiation dumping down the magnetic field lines into the poles of the Earth, um, it causes more radiation to be hitting uh, things like airplanes that are flying over the poles. And a lot of uh, airlines do fly over the poles to save money. So they, they do the great circle and they go from say Europe to Asia or North America to, to Russia or something like that. And they fly right over the pole and through these auroral zones and are bathed in energetic particles coming down the field lines. And that is a, uh, a concern that the crews and of these airlines have. And they often, if there's a lot of geomagnetic activity going on, they will reroute flights. And rerouting a flight is, is not a cheap proposition. It can cost thousands and tens of thousands of dollars because they need more fuel to go around um, the earth rather than over the, earth, over the pole. And in addition, the uh, geomagnetic storms can make the ionosphere have a lot more dynamics and structure. The sun bathing on, on the atmosphere makes the ionosphere kind of um, uniform underneath where the sun is shining. But when you have charged particles coming in, enhancing the ionosphere, you get regions where um, ionization is enhanced around the poles and, and even around the equator due to the way the particles travel. And again, that can have effects on GPS and communications. One of the interesting things that this dynamics in the upper atmosphere causes are induced currents. So you ionize the upper atmosphere and you have um, basically movement of current, charged particles in the upper atmosphere that induces a current down in the surface. And if you have things like pipelines or long cables, transatlantic cables and such, they can, um, pick up that electricity and get a surge going on them. And so uh, pipelines and power grids and cables, communications cables can all be impacted by geomagnetic storms. The, um, an example, a couple of extreme examples, I'm sure you've all heard in the news that uh, SpaceX launched uh, in a single launch 49 of their small Starlink satellites, and they put them into the uh, two, uh, roughly a 210 kilometer orbit where they check them out to see if they're good and then they would normally boost them to a higher altitude. Well, the day after they launched them while they were still checking them out in that low altitude orbit, they had two back-to-back -back geomagnetic storms which weren't that big and they were predicted, but they were um, 
not all that big, but they caused about a 50% increase in density at that altitude. And they lost 40 of those satellites before they could be boosted to higher altitude. And this is an image from, I think, Puerto Rico of uh, a whole bunch of those satellites re-entering. Another example happened back in 1989. There was a big geomagnetic storm and the uh, Hydro-Quebec power grid had a transformer blowout. And this is a picture of one of those kind of transformers. And there's a picture of it after it blew out. Uh, and that was due to ground induced currents that caused surges that just blew the transformer out and caused uh, a power loss for a good portion of the Northeast for uh, uh, about nine hours, including parts of the US. So after all that, who cares about space weather? And the answer is pretty much everybody. We saw all these space weather effects that can happen um, from activity on the sun coming to the earth and interacting with our high-tech um, society or uh, the way of life that depends on so much technology and space itself. And uh, some specific users of space weather information and people who want to know what the space weather is gonna be in the future and what it is now are NASA, the military, because the military relies on GPS, it relies on communications and, and guidance systems and, and satellite observations. And uh, so they're very much impacted by that. Um, shipping industry, the ships use GPS to go through shipping channels. Uh, airlines do the same and airline um, crews we talked about going over the poles commercial satellites, power companies, emergency responders who use satellite telephones to uh, talk to each other, especially when the power is down. And of course, the uh, research community. So what are we doing about it? Well, the whole world is, is getting more and more interested in understanding space weather, monitoring space weather, and uh, sharing information about space weather. And we have national and international space weather programs uh, that are all have different aspects, part in NOAA, NASA, USGS, FAA, the whole national space weather program, uh, Department of Defense and National Science Foundation. And all of those are involved in coordinating things and interacting with other countries and their space weather programs. And we have, uh, various research institutions doing space weather research and improving models and looking at the data taken by these other agencies and and trying to um, every day improve our ability to forecast and now cast. Now casting is, um, let me just explain that a little bit. Now casting is when you take a little bit of data, say from satellites or ground-based measurements, and you interpolate and extrapolate from that all the other parameters that you may need to know. I mean, think about it like weather. We have a few weather stations that are measuring wind speed and temperature. They're not doing it everywhere all the time. It's spaced out and they rely on models to fill in all the gaps. And that, that's pretty much taking things in real time and generating uh, a more complete picture of what's going on right now. And then forecasting is taking that data and extrapolating it into the future and predicting what's going to happen. And I would say based on uh, how things are going and developing in the space weather area, we're getting catching up to weather. We're not there yet, maybe a decade or two behind, but uh, it's a very complex system. NOAA, as part of the US government is, uh, and part of the Department of Commerce, if you recall, many of those people affected by uh, space weather were in the department, were involved in commerce. Um, so NOAA is tasked by our government with space weather monitoring. And NOAA has um, the Space Weather Prediction Center, which is here in Boulder, and it's part of the National Weather Service. 
and the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. NOAA has a list of about 70 space weather uh, parameters that they need to know in real time um, in order to do this now casting and forecast. And about a quarter of these 70 parameters are actually measured by the GOES satellite program. And so now I'll talk to you about GOES. So um, what is GOES? GOES stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. Geostationary means that the satellite is orbiting above Earth at an altitude where its speed um, is the same as the Earth is rotating. So it's orbiting above the equator and going around the Earth at the same speed that the Earth itself is going around. And that makes it so that the satellite is sitting over the same spot on the equator. And it takes 24 hours to go all the way around. Operational means that it's part of NOAA's program to do this real-time monitoring and forecasting and now casting of uh, all the aspects of the Earth system that impact the economy and the environment in our society. It's part of NOAA's charter. Uh, environmental are looking at the various for forces in nature that impact our lives and technology. And you have regular weather and lightning, but you also have sun and space weather. And satellite is obvious, We're observing from space uh, lets you get a global picture and a bigger context and you're not affected by seeing issues such as weather. If it's cloudy, you can't look at the sun, but if you're in space, you can look at the sun all the time. And NOAA has been flying GOES satellites for 47 years. It started back in the mid 1970s and uh, with the first set of GOES satellites. And every three or four set of satellites that they fly, they upgrade the measurement concepts and the technology. And we're currently in um, the GOES-R series, they call it. So the GOES satellites each have a letter before they're launched. And once they get into space, they are given a number. And uh, that uh, doesn't always match up because they've lost satellites and they don't always launch them in the same order as the, their letter. So, I, we're actually missing a few, but uh, goes R, uh, goes R series is R, S, T, and U, and goes R was launched in 2016, and goes S was launched in 2018, and goes T is going to get launched next week on Tuesday the first, hopefully, and uh, goes U the fourth in this series is going to launch in 2024 or later as needed. Um, these satellites and the instruments on them in each series are pretty much the same technology. That's why they uh, make big leaps in these different series of, of satellites. But they try to be um, maintain continuity of calibration and measurement parameters while improving it um, each time so that we have a long climate record also. Now, GOES is so important that they have built-in redundancy. They fly more than one. There's a GOES West and a GOES East, one that's flying in, over the West Coast and looking at the Pacific Ocean and the weather patterns there, and one on the East Coast looking at the Atlantic Ocean and the weather and patterns there. And very frequently, they'll have a spare sitting in the middle ready to be called up immediately if one of these other two um, fails to work. And all of these have the space weather instruments on them also. And so you have a lot of good redundancy in making measurements um, continuously. It's that important that we monitor both the ground-based weather and the space weather continuously. So um, I'm not going to talk about the weather, regular weather satellite or instruments on the GOES-R series of satellites, but I will talk about the uh, four space weather instruments that are on GOES. And you can see that uh, even though 
the weather instruments, the lightning mapper and the imager that give you all your satellite and um, weather meteorology information, they're the ones that get all the big press. Um, there are actually more space weather instruments on GOES. The instrument that we built here at LASP is called EXIS. And EXIS stands for EUV and X-ray irradiance sensors. Uh, the EUV and X-rays are these short energetic wavelengths that get absorbed in the upper atmosphere and drive a lot of you know, space weather we talked about. And irradiance is basically a measurement, an absolute measurement of the amount of light as a function of wavelength coming from the sun and entering into the Earth's atmosphere and be deposited into the atmosphere. And uh, the EXIS instruments, um, there are two sets, one to measure the X-rays and the, uh, that's called the XRS. And the XRS has been flying on a GO satellite since the very beginning. So there's a long 47 year history of these measurements. And the X-rays are how we measure the um, monitor solar flares that go off. And when they talk about the magnitude of a flare, like an X-class flare or something, that is the measurement of the energy in the flare from this X-ray sensor on GOES. It's the standard for measuring flares. Um, the EVS is a relatively new set of measurements started in the previous um, set of GOES, the GOES NOP series. Um, but for goes R, we did a total redesign and concept, um, new concept of how to measure the EUV and how to do a very accurate measurement of it. And uh, that, of course, is measuring the amount of sunlight that's creating the ionosphere and, and affecting satellite drag and, and things like that. Now here's my um, proud PI pictures, my little set of baby photos of uh, Axis. Axis is an instrument that's about the size of a large shoe box or a microwave oven. And uh, it has the X-ray instrument, the X-ray sensor on one side and the rest is all the different channels in the EUV. And uh, can you find Ralphie? We uh, at last try to put the CU Buffalo on all of our instruments and, and we hit it here in the, in the GOES Exus instrument right on the front. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures for Exus and that's our nursery picture. The clean room here at last and all four flight models are GOES R, uh, which is flying on GOES 16 and operating as GOES East right now and has been since 2016. GOES S, which is on GOES 17 or GOES West, has been flying since March 1st of 2018. And both of those have been performing very well. And the next one to go up uh, next week on the first is going to replace GOES West, um, which is interesting because GOES West is the more recent of the two of this new series that is launched, but the um, terrestrial weather instrument, the advanced baseline imager is having problems. So they want to replace it with the new one as soon as possible. And then GOES U will be launched in 2024 um, as needed. Um, so it's kind of a soft launch, no earlier than, but uh, if they don't need it right away, they'll, they'll wait for a little while. The other in space weather instruments, um, the next one is SUVI, which is an ultraviolet imager. And it takes pretty pictures of the sun at six different wavelengths of the extreme ultraviolet. And you can see that the sun looks different at those different wavelengths. And we know we learn different things about the sun and its variability by looking at those different wavelengths. And we can look at those and see um, the structure of the corona, where the active regions are, where the field lines are. We can even see uh, 
coronal mass ejections and watch active regions evolve as they rotate around. And so the SUVI will give us uh, early warning of impacts to our space environment and better um, forecasting of events. And that was built by Lockheed Martin in California. This is a composite movie of uh, a couple of different wavelengths put together um, of the sun. And you can see coronal mass ejections and streamers and the solar wind coming out and even flares occurring on the sun. Um, so SUVI, whereas Exis takes just these spectra and line plots, which aren't very um, media worthy, SUVI gets all the press with the nice pretty pictures of the sun, but there's a lot of science and a lot of uh, forecasting and now casting ability coming from these instruments. The uh, um, DOES also carries instruments that are measuring the environment around the satellite. Basically, um, the particle environment that is bathing the satellite, and the satellite is in orbit around Earth, so it's also what's coming into Earth and the Earth mag magnetospheric system. And the SICE, Space Environment in Situ Suite, is mounted on the body of the satellite, and it's measuring charged particles at different energy ranges and different types of charged particles, electrons and protons and such. And uh, all of that information is giving us a picture of, of these, the charged particle environment around the earth. And then there's a magnetometer, which is on this long boom on the satellite to get it away from the satellite itself. And it's measuring the magnetic fields. So when a CME hits the Earth's magnetic field, it compresses it and chain, mixes it up a little bit. And, and this magnetometer can measure those changes where the satellite is. Um, I forgot to mention that the SUVI and the EXIS are on this platform on the yoke of the solar panel array. So the solar panels always need to be pointed at the sun and the uh, our solar pointed instruments are right on the yoke of that on another, on a platform that can point it in elevation at the sun all the time. Whereas the main body of the satellite is pointed down at the earth to make measurements of, of the clouds and, and terrestrial weather. Now GOES has a very large Colorado connection. As I said, the EXIS was designed and built and tested here at CU at, at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, where we all work. Um, the satellites themselves were built by Lockheed Martin and integrated and tested down in Waterton Canyon, south of Denver, um, which is very handy for us. We didn't have to travel very far. And they built the four satellites of the whole series. We built four exoses, as you saw in our picture. Um, the launch vehicles, for RS and T were Atlas Vs, and they were built by United Launch Alliance, which is based out of Centennial, Colorado. And as I've already mentioned, the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, or SWPC, and the NOAA Centers for Environmental Information, NCEI, are both here in Boulder, and they take the data from GOES, the GOES uh, space weather instruments, and they process that and make data products and run it through models and turned into forecasts and alerts and, and now casts. Um, the EXIS instrument has some very tight um, real-time data requirements, which were fun to try to meet. So our instrument has to provide data from the sun down to earth and through all of the algorithms needed to make these real-time data products within five seconds. And uh, believe me, that's pretty fast and pretty hard to do. And But people need to know right away what's going on on the sun and what's coming um, right away because then they can react and uh, change what they're doing with GPS, with um, navigation and communications and things like that, power grids. Um, 
Here are some pictures of GOES T, the latest GOES to be launched next week. Here's the satellite all bundled up, covered with uh, its MLI, which is a multi-layer insulation to protect, to keep the, um, basically they're like quilts that keep the instruments underneath them in um, good thermal equilibrium, keep them nice and all at the same temperature. Uh, the solar arrays all folded up on the side and uh, it's ready to fit into the, um, the fairing. And this is a picture of the, on the right here, the fairing, which you can see how big all of this is compared to people. Um, they mount the instrument inside this fairing and close it up. And then they lift it up onto the, um, rocket which they've stacked up in this tall building and here is a picture from earlier this week of the fairing on on top of the rock atlas 5 rocket motors um, and this is the assembly building and then this whole rocket is on the uh, um, kind of a platform on railroad tracks that it moves out to the launch pad and uh, it will launch from maybe a few hundred yards away, maybe a little further. So GOES T is ready to go. Um, it's being launched from Cape Canaveral, um, which is the whole launch complex down there. There's the Cape Canaveral side and there's the Kennedy Space Center side. Um, one is NASA, one is the Air Force. And it all depends on what company has rented what launch facility to launch what kind of rockets, but the uh, GOES ones are going from Cape Canaveral and the launch will be at 4.38 p.m. Eastern time or 2.38 Mountain time. The launch window is two hours. So that's the time that the window opens and they've got two hours before they have to scrub and try again the next day if there are technical problems or the weather is prohibitive or anything like that. And that's just so they can get it into the right orbit. You can watch the um, launch online, either through NASA TV, and I provide a link for that if you want to take a screen grab, um, or you can register for uh, virtual launch viewing through the GOES-R program uh, through Eventbrite. And uh, here's a link for that. And yet to come, when goes use la goes you launches, I'll have to give another talk because it's going to have an additional instrument. They've decided to add a coronagraph onto the um, solar pointing flat platform. They're squeezing it right between uh, Axis and SUVI on that platform. And a coronagraph, as I said, is an instrument that stares at the sun but blocks out the bright disk of the sun and lets you image CMEs and, and the solar wind coming out from the sides of the sun. And that helps us to know when and where these CMEs are occurring and whether they're going to have an impact at earth. So stay tuned for that in a few years. And that's the end of my talk. And Amy, I guess we're ready to move to questions. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna clap for you, for everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so we do have a few questions and please, we really encourage questions. So um, please add them to the Q&A. Um, so I think we have some younger attendees um, and one of the questions was about what causes the 11 year solar cycle. And um, I'm gonna add on to that of, is there more activity, CMEs, uh, during certain parts of the solar cycle? So <clears throat> um, it's a difficult to answer question, what causes it? <laughs> That's an active area of research, but uh, the sun, you could think of the sun as having a magnetic field like the earth. You, I, I'm sure you've probably seen the pictures of the earth being kind of like a bar magnet where you have magnetic field lines going um, from the north to the south pole of, of the earth. 
And the sun is like that at solar minimum, but the portion of the sun that creates these magnetic fields actually doesn't rotate at the same speed at all over the whole um, sphere. So the equator is rotating at a different speed than the, the poles and in between. And what happens there is then that the magnetic fields start to get all wound up and they form these knots. And those knots are what cause the active regions. And those knots will suddenly burst out um, energy and those that energy is in the form of flares and coronal mass ejections. And as these magnetic fields get wound up more and more, you get more and more activity and that's called solar maximum. And you get more CMEs and more flares and things like that. And then as those flares and CMEs go off, they're causing the magnetic field to simplify. And eventually you get enough of those going off that it simplifies and it becomes a nice simple um, dipole magnetic field again. And that takes about 11 years to do that except the poles are flipped. So the, the sun every 11 years will flip, which is north and which is south in terms of magnetic, not physically, but the, the magnetic charge. And uh, that's the actual mechanisms of what's going on inside the sun to cause that are, are a little unknown yet, but that's a pretty simple way to, to describe it. Okay, great. Um, I had a question about uh, going back to the Starlink um, satellites. So yeah. you said it was predicted. So the GO satellites did their job, right? And the yep. XS instrument. Um, so in the future, do you think there'll be new instrumentation to predict uh, the impacts on the density of the atmosphere? Um, I think that we're always trying to improve the measurements and the models, but um, I think the information was there and it may not have been taken as seriously as it should. Part of doing anything in space is taking risk and judging whether to risk something or not. And um, I think that one of the factors for the Starlink was the fact that they had two um, two magnetic storms that happened back to back. Neither one of them was very big, but one on top of the other caused a bigger effect than they anticipated and that they had designed for in their in their plan. And I think um, that company and the owner of that company are very much um, risk-taking people. I think if other companies or NASA had been doing those launches, they probably would have uh, scrubbed the launch and waited. But other people can disagree, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so along those lines, uh, there's a question that says, so is our current technology completely incapable of preventing uh, the impacts of these intense space weather events? Or are we getting better? So the first thing to know is to be able to design systems and design hardware and operations to take into account the amount of variability that we'll have. Um, and that to do that, you need to have measured all the different ranges of activity from uh, really big events to really small ones and, and over time. And we can, we can design hardware that will survive and we can design operations that will react properly. Uh, one of the things we can do like with power grids is the power grids are all these wires which act like antennas on the ground and you get currents in the ionosphere that induce currents in those wires. And the Hydro-Quebec um, outage that happened, happened at a time when they were transferring a huge amount of electricity 
from one part of the grid to another. And then this uh, geomagnetic event happened and caused a surge. And even though in normal times, the system would have survived that surge, they were right in the middle of transferring energy at the same time, electricity, and that overloaded the system once the surge was added on top. And if they, this was back in 89, if they had known that this was gonna happen, they wouldn't have transferred the energy at that time or they would have stopped doing it. And so knowing real time what's going on can allow us to adjust what we're doing to be able to survive geomagnetic storms and things like that, any of these impacts. Um, another example is GPS. If you took just a normal GPS receiver and put it in your backyard, and somebody over at Swipsy that I know did this, and watch it and have a solar flare go off, he watched his GPS say that his backyard moved by 40 meters over the time of the solar flare. But if you have the measurements from GOES and other satellites and ground-based things, you can run a model and know that this is going on and adjust, have a piece of software in your GPS or on your computer that adjusts its reading and gives you the right answer without you thinking you're 40 meters away from where you really are. So we have the technology and we have the know-how to do it. We just need to have all of this real-time information and measurements going on, which is why we have things like COES. So what do you think the next generation of GOES will, will have on it? Well, <laughs> they have to continue doing what they're doing because we've gotten reliant on it. Um, they're going to do it better. As I've already said, they're gonna add a coronagraph. Um, they're actually doing a study right now at NOAA to change the architecture of GOES from this um, combined space weather and weather satellites. And they're, they're going to probably remove the space weather satellites from the uh, terrestrial weather satellites because they need different, um, different types of satellites and different types of orbits and things like that. When you wanna look at the sun from a satellite that's designed to look at the earth, it becomes more complex. So why not put all the solar instruments on their own satellite? And I think that's what they're gonna do. Um, another thing that they are, everybody is really interested in doing is getting space weather instruments, um, not just orbiting earth, but orbiting the sun around from the earth and looking as the sun rotates, looking at the part of the sun that we can't see so we can see what's coming around the bend basically and be able to forecast what's coming before it gets here. I think that's where the biggest uh, innovations are gonna happen in the future. Okay. Um... So I assume you're gonna go see the launch. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, leaving on Monday, watch it on Tuesday or Wednesday, whichever day it occurs, and then come home. <laughs> and the weather looks good? Like, what if they miss their window on March 1st and 2nd? What happens? Well, I, they'll just keep waiting and trying. I think that they don't like to give more than one backup because uh, um once they miss one, they'll pick another backup after that. If they give too many days, then that costs too much money to reserve those days and not let other people go off, do their launches. Okay, so um, there are some questions about how GOES relates to some of the other instrumentation that's related to space weather. So like the gold instrument, um, part, uh, Parker Solar Probe, 
um, things like that. And can you comment at all about um, how maybe those instruments are related to goes or how goes can inform those instruments or those measurements? And is there sure, an I'm effort gonna, to combine them or? I'm gonna go back to this slide and GOES is only measuring a few of these arrows and all those other satellites are measuring other arrows and all of that information is going into um, models of the entire sun earth system and the space weather system and giving us important parameters to put into the models to understand what's going on now and to predict what's going on in the future. No one satellite can measure every single one of these things in this diagram. It takes a whole fleet of satellites and instruments. And there are NASA research satellites doing it. There are NOAA satellites orbiting Earth and out at uh, L1, which is between Earth and the sun. We'd like to get some more in other places around the sun, but uh, groups like SWIPC and there's the uh, uh, Space Weather Center at Goddard, NASA and other places um, that take the data from all of these different constellation of satellites and put them into big models that are telling us what is really going on. And, and modeling all of this complex system. So GOES is just one part of the fleet, basically. And there are a lot of ground-based measurements too that help us to understand what's going on in the atmosphere. All right, I think we'll end with that. Um, we uh, didn't get to all the questions. I apologize to all our participants. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, we will have the questions printed out for um, Frank that he's going to be very busy with the launch um, for the next couple of weeks, but um, if he can get to any of them, he will try to answer them. Um, and like I said before, this has been recorded and so we'll have it on um, our public lecture website uh, in a couple of days. So you can go back and revisit it if you would like to or pass it on to your uh, favorite friend. Uh, thank you so much, Frank. Uh, we really appreciate your time and um, all your amazing explanations of a very complicated system. And uh, good luck, go goes, go Axis. Go Axis. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much.